Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. My name is Brent Yersmith. I have Dangerous Dave on camera. We have Jamie and Jeandre out in the other vehicle. And we have Geraldine and Louise in final control. And happy Easter, everyone. So what an incredible end to the Sunset Safari last night with the Queen of Juma, Karula. So what we are going to do is we're going to make our way back in towards that area. Maybe she went to feed the cubs and then came back. Who knows? So we're going to make our way towards the south western corner of Juma and go down the southern boundary, see if we can find any tracks. Now, it is an absolutely gorgeous morning. It's about 19 degrees Celsius, 66 Fahrenheit, barely a cloud in the sky. I think we're going to have an amazing sunrise and an exciting Easter morning sunrise safari. So let's get going. Let's see what's out there. Great to have you all on board. So when it's nice and dark like this, we do go a little bit slower, and that's just so we don't miss any tracks. So we will be looking. I'm pretty confident Queen Karula did not come back to Juma last night, but I would probably kick myself if I didn't check, so we shall be checking to see if we have any luck. Now, I'm pretty sure that Dyker is completely finished, but we will double check, see if it's attracted any hyenas or anything like that. One interesting thing is I think a little bit later, once the sun is above the horizon, we might get some battalers or maybe some predatory birds that find their way towards that remnant of a carcass. So we're going to go have a look. But first things first, we're going to check the boundary. Now, Tingana has been slowly moving to the northwest. So who knows, maybe we'll find him. And of course, Mvula, who is now pretty much a dispersal male, sneaking around, hiding between the other male's territories, might always be around. Hopefully, while he's dispersing, he sets up shop around Juma. It seems like he's found a little niche for himself in the northwest, uh, where the male leopards don't spend as much time. So I think he's there to hide from Tingana. And he did cross into some Bambili. He walked a couple of kilometers there, and then I think he got an Anderson scent mark and uh, decided discretion was the better part of that. Turned tail and headed back towards us. So his last tracks were pretty much in that area there, probably about a kilometer and a half from us. So you never know whether we're going to find his tracks. Hopefully, because Karula mated with him, um, if he does come across her and the cubs, he won't eat them. But we can never be sure. So 70% of all the cub mortalities in the Sabi Sands are other male leopards are responsible. So they often kill leopard cubs that they are not convinced are their own, but it's normally your dispersal males like Quarantine and Kunyuma that do the killing of cubs. So very interesting time at the moment. And of course, a very dangerous time for Karula's cubs. Now, in the African bush, as I said, and in the Sabi Sands in particular, where we've got a lot of data on this, uh, between 70 and 75% of all leopard cubs do not make it beyond a year. And of that, most of them are killed by other male leopards. And the next, the other 30% are made up of a completely, a very large spectrum of other animals that can kill leopard cubs. I mean, some have been killed by buffalo, some have been killed by python. Some have even been killed by a bird, a martial eagle, the largest bird species that we get in this area. And it's going to be fascinating. Of course, hyena is another threat to those cubs, but Karula is such a good mom. Fingers crossed, she manages to bring these next two to adulthood. Now, we have been giving her, when she has been on in a den, quite a wide berth just to give her the best chance at raising those cubs possible. But 
we are getting to the stage now where those cubs are able to climb trees. So we will be able to start viewing them, and I'm very excited for that, and I'm sure most of you guys are as well. If there are any new viewers who happen to stumble across this live African safari, you will see I'm driving around in the dark, shining a spotlight. And if you're wondering why I'm doing that, please feel free to pop me a question on an, e on an email at questions at wildearth.tv, or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So very exciting times out here in the African bush. And of course, if there's no leopards and lions to look at, I will keep you enthralled with butterflies, bugs, and flowers. So Red on YouTube says so they just want to see the eyes of a leopard shining in the dark. Me too. Hopefully we can do that and taking it one step above and beyond, we find the eyes of a leopard shining in the dark and then take it through to show you the beautiful coat in the golden morning light. But that is an ideal circumstance. But we are in the African bush and it is live. So we cannot plan what happens. This is not a zoo. And of course, there are boundaries uh, that are man-made. There are no fences, so the animals are more than welcome to cross them. However, we are not. So hopefully, whatever happens, those leopards and lions decide to visit us on this sunrise, Easter sunrise safari. But while we continue to check, let's go see what Jamie's up to on the other vehicle. Good morning and, oh, spider web. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie, and I have Jandre on camera with me on this bright and crisp morning. We've passed a milestone, I feel. The temperature's dropped below 20 degrees centigrade. It is 19 this morning, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. But definitely the chilliest it has been so far this year, as far as I can tell. Apart from maybe some of those cloudy, windy, rainy mornings. I hear that Brent was chatting a little bit about Mvula and the fact that yesterday we were trying to track him. I've returned to the area just in case I missed his track somewhere and that he's popped out. Either way, we've got exciting prospects for the drives ahead. And on that note, this afternoon for our sunset safari, we will be doing an Easter egg hunt of sorts. Between Brent and myself, we will be hiding the egg for each, hiding eggs for the other. And then we're gonna be needing you guys to help us figure out the clues. We won't know where the other presenter has hidden them, but we will get clues, something along the lines of, oh, I don't know. Um, the big toxic tree with latex that's on twin dams kind of deal. And then you can tell us that it's a Tamburti tree, and off we will go in search of our lovely Easter eggs. We'll just be ready for that surprise, not surprise, be ready for that this afternoon. Could be highly entertaining, depending on how complex or how difficult a hiding spot we choose to hide the eggs in. Oh, well, if Mvula did come out on this road, the elephants have definitely obscured his tracks. <laughs> and Lucy in Indiana, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering if I could find a scrub hair since it is Easter. I'll keep my eyes peeled, Lucy. Just while you were with Brent, I saw two of them. They were dashing across the road, but yes. I'm almost certain that at some point during the day today, we will find a scrub hair. Oh. We're going to go along towards the Impala Plains Junction anyway. So, that's where they like to hang out. Distracted by hyena tracks. Lots of hyena tracks. I'm distracted by a lot of hyena tracks. Hold on one second, I'm just gonna go off the road here, just like, see if I can figure out what's happening. When you see lots of hyena tracks like that, you start to wonder about what's happening. Because I've got a 
half full of Indo. Mm. No, it's three of them moving together. It's not, it's not the cubs being moved, as was my first thought. Looks like three adults moving down the road together. I've also come out armed with Liam's trusty calipers to continue our project from yesterday afternoon. We've been measuring the different tracks. Yesterday we did a bullas. And BM has very kindly allowed me to borrow them for the duration of the next few weeks on the basis that I provide him with all of the information that we get once we do get it. I'm trying to see if in the future we'll be able to identify individuals from their size of their exact size of their tracks. I'm thinking less about the hyenas though. I'm not even going to try that with hyenas. Mike in Florida on the subject of animals you want to see we've got a request from a for a scrub here but Mike in Florida would like to see a white-tailed mongoose we'll definitely be keeping an eye out Mike see if we can't find one for you we know of at least one that's been denning around the Juma Dam pan I have to admit, I'm very curious as to what's got the hyenas so interested in this area. Bullis tracks came in and out and in and out of this block. I wonder if he didn't have, the, if they didn't manage to get the leftovers of some kind of kill. That is complete supposition, of course. I have absolutely no particular reason for thinking that. Sorry, but yes, Mike, I will keep an eye out for a white-tailed mongoose for you. Already, particularly because it's all it's only the full moon is only just starting to wax not to, not to wax to wane and so the lights are very very bright I think that it's already a little bit too late in the morning to spot one but you never know the mysteries of the night are waiting to be unraveled Yes, I forgot about that. James Richards was wondering if there's any word on the wild dogs. James, there is a good chance that we could be seeing wild dogs either this morning or this afternoon. Last I heard, they were just to the western boundary of our traverse area. But we will most definitely be keeping an eye out for them as well. Hopefully they decide to come skittering at high speed onto Juma. We'll be able to give you a nice wild, and ourselves, a nice wild dog sighting once again. It's been a little while. I'm not sure which pack it is, but that is the information that I got from some of the guides about the wild dogs. So yes, James, we could see them. I will be asking for updates on the Game Drive channel once I get to that, when I get to the right sort of crest and height. believe how much this vegetation has changed in the last two weeks it's incredible the spotlighting it is tricky just to get behind the bushes right I'm gonna carry on my patrol of almost our western boundary see if I can find out anything about the wild dogs while I do that let's find out how Brent's morning is going so we on to the southern boundary just checking to see if Queen Karula crossed back in so far I've only seen her tracks leaving us but this is a very busy road, so it's possible they have been driven over. But what we're going to do is we'll head back towards where she had that diker carcass. There, Ooh, she did leave a little bit of meat, so there's a, a small chance, and I say a very small chance, that she might have returned to feast off 
one or two legs that were remaining. So we discussed that male leopards frequently kill other leopard cubs. Now, Debbie is wondering, do females ever kill cubs? Uh, they do if it's very unusual. So I'm just looking for trucks here. Um, they do kill cubs, but it is unusual. The females' territories are far more set, and males will have multiple females in their territory. And of course, uh, when a female leopards sequester a section of their, their territory to their daughters. So they start with a far more set territory, where those, those young males are far more uh, nomadic for those first few years. So if a female does kill cubs, then the other female has made a very big mistake in where she's decided to den, because it could be very close to a, an edge of a, of a territory or, or home range. So normally they try to keep their dens right in the center of their home range to avoid the possibility of another female killing the cub. I mean, it is, it is possible, it's just a lot less unlikely. A lot more unlikely, sorry. In, in New Zealand, <laughs> uh, said if both Karula's cubs are male, would we name them Bismarck and Yanni after two Springbok rugby players who are brothers? Uh, well, I probably not, Aaron. Um, I know, being a Kiwi, you would probably name uh, name them Dan and who's that? Oh, and Kieran now after Dan Carter and Kieran Reed. But no, uh, we would probably name them. We probably uh, if. I have the naming rights, I would probably give them a Shangan name. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see once we start seeing their characters develop. Uh, that will depend on their name. So when it comes to naming leopard cubs, we don't even bother about it till they're a year old. Because, as I said, only 30% of leopard cubs survive to that year. Once they get to a year, that mortality rate drops down uh, substantially to about 10 or 12 percent. Now, in females, that'll stay the same for pretty much the rest of their life, right till they start getting sort of old, around 14, 15 years old. But with males, it drops down to that sort of 10, 12 percent for till they go nomadic. So till, till they become dispersed males, then it ri raises again as they start trying to find their own territory to a little bit higher, 25 to 30 percent. But once they become established and ha ha hold the territory, it drops again back down to that 10 or 12 percent. And then once the male leopards get over sort of 13, it shoots up again to around 60, 70 percent. So very different depending on a, a leopard's time. Female leopards have a, a lot sort of more stable platform to work off. So once they reach a year old, their mortality rate is quite low. This is where she crossed last night. Um, their mortality rate is quite low until they become very old and it's sort of the end of their lives. Beautiful sky up ahead. We're heading east at the moment. Well, Anna Marie, don't be a negative Nelly. Um, Anna Marie seems it seems the leopards only like the sunset drives at the moment. Uh, big sigh. Well, hopefully we can change that this morning, Anna Marie. We need your positive thoughts to help us. So there's a, a little river system in to the south of us here, and that's where it seems that. Karula is keeping her cubs at the moment. Now, this 
sort of section where we are here around the Mawati River system, which is down there, uh, is very much the core of Karula's territory. So very unlikely that another female will interlope. So a very good place for her to keep them. Of course, us being a little bit selfish, we want her to move those cubs back onto Juma. So we're going to head towards where she had that duck. So as I said, there's a very small possibility she might be back on the spot. Uh, but I didn't think there was much meat. Maybe she was so full that she decided to go feed the cubs and then come back to finish off the last few bony morsels that were left of that Grimm's bush diker. But we will find out very shortly. We're about three minutes away. Still checking for tracks. I don't see any tracks coming in. I've only seen her tracks leaving. So, Alice. Good morning, Alice. I hope you are having a fantastic Easter. Alice is wondering, do I think this is going to be Karula's last litter, given her age? Oh, it's difficult to say. I mean, I've seen a, a female leopard who's produced the litter at nearly oh, 14 and a half. So it's possible she might have one more litter in her, uh, but this is definitely one of her last litters. Uh, but hopefully she can prove us all wrong. But if we had to take leopards as a norm, this is definitely going to be one of her last litters. Uh, particularly if any of those little, guy, little cubs are female, because then her, her territory will shrink again as she gives away a the best piece of that to uh, her daughter. Okay, we're nearly there now. So that kill was just in here last night, but we're going to move around where it's a little bit easier to access and not as thick. I'm seeing quite a few hyena footprints. Maybe they came to scavenge uh, the remnants that she dropped. Oh, why are we there? There's a, a nice little bird. Quite a noisy bird at this time of the morning. This one seems to be quite quiet. You got him, Dad? Let me just go forward a bit. It's a white crowned shrike. There he is. Giving his beak a good clean. Now they can be incredibly noisy. And you can see that very distinct little hook on his beak. So these guys occasionally will hang prey species that they've killed, insects and, and lizards and things, on thorns in a thorn tree like the one it's sitting in. But they don't do it as often as the other strike, shrike species. So I think the shrike species we're likely to find hanging different things they've killed is most likely to be the red-backed shrike or the magpie shrike. So Dave, oh, it's going to be difficult. If you come down, and down to the ground. OK, now between, there's a little gap between the trees, so start zooming. Go up a little bit, and down a little bit, right there. Now, it's going to be quite difficult to see. There's a Grimm's bush diker there, just behind, I think, possibly. Let me try to go back a bit. Just notice that trying to sneak through behind the shrike. No, it's done a really good job at disappearing behind those thickets. So, right in the area where Karula ate one, there's already another one in its place. Now, Karula is really, really fond of these quite thick areas where you've got a lot of monkey orange thickets. And uh, she does prefer to hunt 
dike here in Stenborg, and, and these areas are great for them. They're by far probably the most common antelope species in these areas. Being a small female and quite an old female now, and she tends to stay away from the bigger prey like adult impala and things like that. Choosing a, a, a less high risk meal in those smaller antelope species. Have a look at where that kill was. As I said, there's a there's a very small chance she might still be around here. And I emphasize that again. That actually, me, it's a minuscule chance rather than a small chance. But we will have a look. She is not here, but I still can see pieces of the dike hanging from the tree. Maybe she might come back to finish off those little pieces a little bit later. Uh, we will definitely check again later on the drive. Really not much food left there at all. So there we go. Not much food, just some skin and some bones. But as I said, there's always a possibility she might come back, especially since she's got cubs. It might be enough to entice her back. So we will come back and check. And it doesn't look like any hyenas have been if we look at the bottom of the tree. She did drop some relatively large pieces of bone uh, to the right slightly, Dave. And there we go, zoom in there. A little bit up. Over to the right. There we go, that dark thing. There is actually some bone. Maybe if we roll back, it's behind a leaf. There we go, you see it now, Dave? Right in the V of that tree. So if you zoom, there we go. There, there's some of the stuff she dropped last night. And the hyenas aren't here yet, so they obviously haven't found this location. But we will come back and check a little later on the sunrise safari. But for now, let's go have a look at this gorgeous sunrise with Jamie. As I said, it is the most spectacular morning. That crisp coolness giving the morning a certain clarity, at least in terms of what we're seeing. What's less clear to me is how come I've got all the hyena tracks in the world on this side of Juma, and yet Brent doesn't see or hasn't seen any signs of hyenas coming to sniff around Karula's kill site. It's very interesting. But I know that he was talking about Karula's prey of choice and how she seems to prefer Dacre and Steenbock at this point in her life. But we have come across um, another herd of the leopard's favorite food, Unfortunately, most of them have decided to slowly wander off, but the impala is looking much darker than they usually do. They're all puffed up to insulate themselves from the cold. With their hair standing up on end, it gives them a far darker color, especially across their backs. They are truly beautiful animals. On the, the subject of impala, Something that I heard yesterday when I was asking about wild dogs and where they were, Salayesha's cub, and Salayesh, of course, being a female leopard that is off to the western area of Arethusa, so in Elephant Plains, apparently at nine months old, took down an adult male impala by herself. That's a female cub, a nine-month-old female leopard cub taking down an impala. Of course, Salacia was seen mating with the Anderson male, so it could be that those genetics are coming through the Anderson male being one of the largest leopards that's ever been seen in the Sabi Sands. So perhaps he is the father, and she's taking after her dad, who has been known to drag a small giraffe up into trees. 
nevertheless, that is an incredibly impressive feat. If you think about what Brent was saying about how Karula no longer goes for or tends to favor smaller prey, a female leopard cub of nine months old, it's incredible. And a very impressive skill set that little cub has got going on. Uh, of course, sitting with the impalas, they are on the menu for most animals. But Natasha de Ontario was wondering, another spiderweb, whether or not there's any other animal that a leopard, or there's any animal that a leopard won't eat. No, not really. Um, they're not as fussy as, uh, uh, they're not fussy at all. They will, we saw Vula stalking buffalo calves. That, that's an unusual situation, as are giraffe kills for leopards. It's also an unusual situation. They generally tend to favor smaller prey, because as you can imagine, a buffalo or a giraffe is, first of all, seriously much heavier than a leopard. A big male leopard over 100 kilograms, over 200 pounds, maybe and tackling a giraffe or a buffalo, even if it's just a youngster, the adults can still defend, can and will defend their calves. And you're talking about adults weighing up to close to a ton, so close to 2,000 pounds compared to 200. So although those are the exceptions, it does happen. They will also hunt the smaller things. If a mouse runs across in front of a leopard, there's a chance they will go for them. They are not fussy in the slightest. I'm trying to think if there is anything specifically a, a leopard won't eat. Probably a lion or another leopard, but that is not always the case. What are all these impalas looking at? What have you seen? Nothing. Nothing, just looking. Looking very carefully. A little bit skittish this morning. So generally when carnivores kill each other, generally they tend not to feed on the carcass of the carnivore that they've killed. So I've seen leopards kill serval before and not eat them. Lions have killed other lions before and not really fed on them. It does of course happen as it did with the Birmingham boys and that case of the leopard the cheetah that killed the impala that was killed by a leopard in the Kruger. That does happen, but it's less likely. Other than that, Natasha, I can't think of a single animal that a leopard would not eat. You can't afford to be fussy when every day is a fight for survival. And speaking of animals that are not fussy, just as an update, I'm on my way towards the hyena den. We'll stop in there quickly before it gets too warm. And see what they are up to. <laughs> ah, Tom. Apparently Tom has wanted to let me know, wanted to know if I knew or had remembered that today was the day of the great boat race. And apparently Tom is um, supporting Oxford and therefore we are sworn enemies. This of course being the great boat race between Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, Tom, I forgot completely, to be honest. I will probably watch it depending on times and what I happen to be doing. Oh, no, I won't be watching it because the electricity has gone out. Shall we see if we can figure out what bird that is? So, Tom, I'm not sure. I think it was Oxford's victory last year. I always feel as though one of my greatest achievements at university was avoiding the rowing team. They desperately attempted to get me to join. This looks like it might be and Wahlbergs, it's difficult to tell into the sun, but there's that little bit of a crest at the top of the head. Tail doesn't seem square enough, though. 
either way makes for a very dramatic silhouette. Okay, I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure which raptor that is. That crest on the top of the head is fairly distinctive, or fairly obvious at least. But we'll have to just keep looking. Maybe we'll see it in slightly better light as the morning goes on. Okay, on towards the hyena den. And yes, I said my, my greatest achievement in at university was not rowing. I say that not because I have anything against rowing. And in fact, they were desperate to try and get me as a cox for one of the rowing teams just because I'm not exactly the largest person on earth. But it was just, I mean, I don't do well with the cold as it is. So putting me on the river at 5.30 in the morning in the UK was not ever going to be a feasible option in terms of what I was going to do with my life. The cold and I do not work together very well. Oh, Tom, we shall see. We shall see who emerges victorious. I know somebody on the women's rowing team I'll see what she thinks is going to happen today. Sure, elephants everywhere. Just have a look at... and tracks all over the show. They've been very active last night. All off going towards the south. Elephant tracks have that beautiful back track that creates almost like an arrow pointing in the direction that they're going. So if I, mm, that's not very clear. We'll come back to it when the, the sun's up a little bit. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Now, somehow, I think measuring the elephant tracks with our calipers, short of it being the absolutely tiniest elephant, might be beyond the, the reach of VM's calipers. Isn't that a beautiful morning? Absolutely stunning. Hopefully these elephants haven't gone tramping through the hyena den and prompting the hyenas to move. I don't think so, though. Elephants is actually how we found this den many months ago initially. Ooh, this bright purple sunspots in front of my eyes. Liam and myself had gone in to follow some elephants slightly off-road and we were about to make our way back to poor Scott for fireside chat and Nikki noticed that there was a hyena in our screen. Liam had just turned the camera to the side while I was sorting something out and we followed the hyenas to the den and then suddenly realized that we had to get back for fireside chat and poor Scott was left for a good 20 minutes all by himself chattering away while we raced back from the hyena den. Okay, we're not too far from the hyena den, so why don't you jump on with Brent so he can tell you his plan for the morning, and I'll catch up with you shortly. So, no sign of Karula coming back across the southern boundary. So, we've left the area, we're gonna head we're heading down the eastern edge of our traverse. A really good place to look for tracks. Sorry, guys. Just on the game drive. Okay. Nothing serious. No major updates just yet. 
So this is a, a great place to check for tracks. Nice sandy road and, and it's a very popular thoroughfare for quite a lot of animals and I saw some tracks there but uh, as I didn't think they were a leopard but they just are very nice clear tracks and you see them Dad. Very, very clear tracks. And uh, just go a little bit forward, maybe we can see them a bit better. There we go. There we go. An African civet has meandered down the road at some point during the night on its nightly wanderings in search of different things to eat. But very nice, clear tracks. And that's the one thing that's so nice about looking for tracks on this particular road, the sand does give us a really good platform to work off. So a very big Safari Live welcome to Mr. Crispy, who's a new viewer. So welcome to the Safari Live family. Uh, and you'd like to know what type of animal are we looking for? A lioness. Uh, we were looking for a female leopard, but unfortunately it looks like she's meandered south of our traverse zone. So now we're looking for whatever we might be able to find. Yeah. So we're going to, oh, there we go. We found something. There's a little stand boggy running across the road. A little female stand bog. Now, that is not a baby, that is an adult. They are very small, and we often find them up on the crest, so up on the high ground away from the drainage systems. And we were chatting about how Karula, that female leopard we were looking for, this is one of her favorite things to eat. So she often spends time hunting up on the crests and in areas very similar to the one we're in at the moment, because they do have, it does have a high density of dica and stenbork which are two of her favorite prey species. Off goes the stand buckle. Now, very, very dainty and pretty antelope. They also are one of the only monogamous antelope we have here. Not truly monogamous, but they do pair for life. But uh, a male or female who finds someone near the edge of the territory will have a, a sneaky little philander. But generally, they will stay together till the other is being eaten by a leopard, mostly, is what happens to them. Uh, very interesting. They're also one of the only animals we have that is not reliant on standing water. So they get enough moisture from the dew in the early mornings and during truly dry times. They'll actually dig out bulbs and tubers of different plant and grass species and uh, get their moisture content from that. And there are quite a lot of them. They don't like to stand too still when we put a camera on them. Being that small, uh, everything might try eat you. So the smaller you are, the more predators you have. And little standbok even fall prey to some of the larger eagle species we get here. So it pays to be cautious if you're a standbok. Now, stien is a brick in Afrikaans, and that's how they get the, got their name. One of their defense strategies against predators is to keep basically as still as stone or as still as a brick, uh, hence their common name, the Stenbok. So I'm hoping we find some lion tracks this morning, and this is always a good spot to check for them. But while we continue to check for any movement on the eastern front, Jamie's in the north and west with the second most dominant predator at Juma. Mm. Well, we're not, oh, hold on, hold on. I was about to say we, we, the second most dominant predator is still in bed, but I think somebody's coming to say hello, slowly but surely, on the left-hand side of us. Good morning. I was just about to leave. It's going to come round. You'll see it right now. It'll come there. There you go. Hello. 
<laughs> Somebody's been walking in mud. With your mud socks. Well, at least there's some action at the hyena den. The cubs are having a lion this morning. <laughs> you can almost hear him saying, will you come out and play with me? Investigating to see if there's any company. Nope. They're not one to wake up, little one. What on earth? Scared him like that. How very strange. But it wasn't anything that came from us. I'm just trying to look behind me. That hyena looked straight off in this direction and then rushed away. Andre, I don't see anything, do you? Mm -mm. I have absolutely no idea what scared that hyena. I didn't even hear anything. And it definitely wasn't us. Okay, bye-bye, hyena. Should we just go onto the road, see if we can't figure out what that was that startled him? Who knows, maybe there's lions walking down the road and we just haven't realized yet. Something gave that hyena a massive fright. Although, that being said, at that age, everything gives those hyena a fright. They are accustomed to being bullied at that age by the adults and by the cubs. It's an awkward age because they are no longer favored as the little one, precious little ones. Uh, plus, they are bullied by cubs because the moms will protect the cubs if they can't have anything to complain about. And they've left the safety of the den. And all of that combined makes them a little bit more skittish than normal, which is a good thing, because that is probably the most dangerous time in a hyena's life, is the sub-adult stage. Cap on. That might help spotting anything it might be about. Hmm. Just gonna go check the bubbles of boundary. And a warm welcome to Trevor, who is a new viewer watching on YouTube. Sorry, Jandre. At least that one didn't have thorns. Um, Trevor was wondering, speaking about our hyenas, is there any difference between a male and a female hyena? And Trevor, yes, although it can be, particularly in young individuals, very difficult to see. So what you're looking at, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the uh, biology of a hyena, the, spot, the spotted hyena in the females, they are larger, they have high levels of testosterone and androgen, and they also have basically false penises, or pseudo penises, which can make telling the difference between a male and a female exceptionally tricky. Let's just check carefully. Sorry, let's just check carefully along here. I cannot figure out what scared that hyena. Maybe just. An unidentified noise in the bush sent him dashing away. Yes, you can tell the difference. If by looking at the tip of the penis or pseudo-penis itself, it is slightly more sort of, there's a, there's a sort of a, a nip towards the end of that of a male. Whereas with females, it's, it's much straighter. It's almost uniform in terms of thickness. It doesn't have that slight inwards dent and then out again. That being said, I've used that before on hyena cubs when they are still young. And it can be very difficult in females that haven't bred yet. It's not always that clear. I've considered a, I've sexed a hyena cub as a male before, only to come back two years later to find that it was pregnant. It can be quite easy to mistake that. 
particularly since this was a lower ranking female, so she was treated quite badly by the rest of the clan. So it almost was like she was almost low enough ranking to be treated like a male in her hyena society. This wasn't here, by the way. This was in the air, on the reserve I used to work at. And the biggest difference, probably one of the best ways to tell the difference between male and female hyena is their size and behavior. A more dominant animal is usually female and the less dominant animal is usually male, but that doesn't always apply. And obviously the best way is if you see them suckling cubs. But they do have, in addition to the pseudo penis, they've also got false testes that look very much like a normal scrot male scrotum. So it's surprisingly tricky with hyenas, particularly with young ones of lower rank. Luckily for us at the moment, we've spent so much time at the den that we've really started to get quite a good handle on the different hyena dynamics. It's such a fascinating aspect of the way in which they have evolved. One of those things that is not truly understood by biologists as to why it was that that sort of spiderweb, why that sort of system came to be and what made spotted hyenas so different that they are the one exception to the rule of males being bigger and stronger. There's a lot of theories about it. The most dominant mother theory. So the more testosterone, the larger the female is capable of growing, the more aggressive she can be in terms of access to food. And therefore, the more milk she will be able to produce at a better quality. road in a while. thought I'd just go for a brief trip along it. Aaron, who is watching in New Zealand, welcome to the sunrise safari on this glorious African morning. You were wondering what the chances are, speaking about hyenas and their cousins, you were wondering what the chances are of seeing a brown hyena on these live drives. Well, as far as I know, one was seen once. Um, that was with Peter Pretorius many, many years ago. We have yet to see one. I thought, I thought I saw one crossing Triple M a couple of weeks ago. It was not on the live drive, it was just driving home. And I thought I saw one very far ahead. It was just the, the shape of the body, the sloping short, the sloping back and the shaggy fur immediately brown hyena sprang to mind. So the chances are actually relatively slim, but still anything is possible. I would be incredibly excited about something like an aardwolf, for example. I'm just stopping to have a look at the helmet tracks. I'm not sure if I've put the tree in the way. No, there you go. I'm just listening to the game drive updates. It seems as though the wild dogs have actually crossed, where, crossed east, which is exactly what we wanted them to do, but they've crossed east south of our boundary, which is exactly what we didn't want them to do. But you never know. Still cool enough this morning for them to be dashing about like mad things, and hopefully they will decide to come north. As you know, Predicting where wild dogs are going to go and following wild dogs is next to impossible at times. I'm hoping that that might work in our favor this morning and they might come and join us. That's a huge distance they've covered already today. If they were left on elephant plains on the western side of Arethusa and they're now in Little Gauri on the southern side of our boundary, what would that be in terms of distance? That must be at least six or seven kilometers that they've covered in the last, they probably got up this out at the same time we did. So in the last 
hour, they've covered seven kilometers. And that's just in a straight line. Safari, you joined us for the first time yesterday and now joining us in the morning on our side. And Nathan was saying or wondering, are there more animals on the sunrise safari or the sunset safari or at sunrise or sunset? And the answer is either or. It depends on what you want to see. So at this time of the morning, absolutely anything could be moving about. Cheetah could be moving, wild dog, leopards, lions, everything will move at this time while it's still cool. So there's always the chance for the larger predators. But then at the same time, because it has been a full moon night and it has been, or the, the, there's been a lot of ambient light, in the sunrise safari, you are far less likely to see a nocturnal, one of the rarer nocturnal species, as a general rule. That's not necessarily always the case at all, but that is a distinctive possibility. So Nathan, I don't think I could choose between one or the other. Oh, there are just doves in the tree. All right, I'm going to continue on looking for wonders to show you while I do that. Let's find out how Brent's morning's going. So you might notice I'm driving a little faster than normal. I've just got a report that there are male leopard tracks on top of our tracks. So, fingers crossed we're going to be able to track them. I wonder who it could be. I think it's Tingana coming in from the south. So, we're going to head down. We're about to drop to the west towards the Moati River system. So, according to the update I got, the squirrels were still alarming. So, we must have been about five or six minutes ahead of that leopard when we crossed through. So, but fortunately, those tracks are coming into Juma. So let's go have a look. An exquisite morning. Still quite chilly. I definitely think winter is on its way. Now, I'm sure a lot of you think 60 hectares, 6 degrees Fahrenheit is quite pleasant. Now, for me, I've got goosebumps. I'm very cold. I'm even considering putting a blankie over my legs, but maybe not just yet. And uh, for the viewers who watched through the winter months of last year, you'll notice I turned to the Michelin Man. The amount of layers of clothing I, I, I wear to try and beat off the cold. I think this year I'm going to get a balaclava, so all you're going to be able to see is my eyes. The sandblaster would like to know do we ever see those very large African porcupines in our wanderings around Juma? Uh, we do, but generally they're, they're, they're out and about after game drive time. We've got a very healthy porcupine population here at Juma. And Juma, oh, Sandblaster says, he even read that, that they killed, one killed a leopard back in 2012 in Kruger. Well, Sandblaster, it probably didn't actually kill the leopard. What quite often happens uh, is a leopard will try to hunt a porcupine and it'll get those uh, quills impaled in its face and feet. And then infection sets in and the leopard dies from the infection, uh, from the quills being embedded. So those quills actually have uh, tiny little microscopic barbs that you can't see with the naked eye. So once they're embedded, when they very difficult to pull out. Now, a certain leopard will actually specialize in hunting porcupine, but most leopard will just generally try to give them a, a wide berth. They are a very difficult species to catch. Uh, 
I know of leopards and lions that have died as a result of injuries from porcupine quills. Now, I'm going to preempt before I get asked. So in a circumstance like that, would, oh, hello, big boy. Would we interfere? Would we help the leopard? Would we call a vet to remove those quills and give him an antibiotic? No, we would not. It is nature taking its course and nature controlling its own numbers. So here we go, big male kudu. And beautiful animal. We're not going to stay too long with them. I'm going to keep moving just because we want to be on those leopard tracks when they are fresh, 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 fresh. It gives us the best opportunity of actually finding that animal. So, and also, this first hour of the sunrise safari is the, really the best time to look for cats. It's still quite cool, so it's when they're still moving. So it is now is the, the best time. I mean, we can always find leopard at any time, but I generally like to look for them at this time in the morning. Sorry, guys, Taxon's just sitting, go, getting hold of me. Standing by. Yeah, but this comes off from uh, one of the things we're playing uh, on uh, 10 Downs Road. Kobe, thanks, Tax. I'm about halfway down Mamba at the moment. Uh, confirm you just want me to check, uh, carry on Mamba, or I can check the Mawati if, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah just double checking. Um, it looks like it's going uh, straight um, north. So, good news. So, Tax is also following from where that leopard crossed on top of our tracks. And we're going to try leapfrog ahead. Range, I'm coming south down the Anagosh Shortcut. I'll check from the pan side. Kobe, thanks. So, exciting times. And yeah, it's going straight along the uh, Pink Dumps Road. There you go. Yeah, so, I do apologize about how loud the radio is, but um, it does help us find road. animals. And a lot of people don't realize that finding animals is a team game. It's not a solo sprint. So we all chat with each other, and we will all check different areas to make sure we've got the best possible chance of finding the different animals. So Montana's wondering how many spotters or trackers do we use during a drive? Is it, or is it just me and Jamie? At the moment, uh, from our crew point of view, it is just me and Jamie. But uh, at certain times, we will increase or decrease the amount. So normally, when there's three or four of us on the ground, uh, not every morning, but some mornings, uh, when we're not sitting in front of camera, we'll go out and track uh, for the guys who are out on camera. So it's always fun, and it also gives us a chance to walk quite a bit. And walking by yourself in the bush is a really special thing for me. And you do see and hear a lot more when you're doing that. So the last time I went on a big walk by myself when I wasn't on camera, and didn't have to be on camera, I had the most incredible honey badger sighting. The honey badger didn't even see me, and it came about three meters from me. Now also, when you're walking by yourself, there's a lot less noise, so your ears are more active. You hear and see and smell things that sometimes you wouldn't when there's other people that can distract your attention. But it is very exciting, and I do love walking. And hopefully we will be having the bushwalk up and running uh, again in a couple of weeks. So that'll be very, very, very exciting to actually get off and walk around with you guys a bit and we will be able to show you lots of really cool things, especially after the rain. There's a lot of really nice insects that we probably can't get that close to um, from the vehicles. Okay, so Tax has just asked me to check here. Copy will do. So I'm just gonna jump off the vehicle for a second. And you guys are more than welcome to join me and I'll explain from Elephant Stone today. We just want to double check which direction just you go. Okay, we're just listening. So the last tracks are just down there. So I'm going to have a quick look. 
just to make sure. So it's always better to check for tracks um, on foot than from a vehicle, unless they're really, really obvious. So, I mean, he could just stand on a patch of grass. So we're just going to have a quick look. So there's no tracks here. The last tracks are just down there. It's always good to listen as well. Wonderful birds calling this morning. OK. So it doesn't look like there are any tracks there. I do see some tracks in the rut of the Milwaukee River there. I just want to have a look at them. Hyena. So he hasn't come this way. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down in the riverbed and see if we find any tracks here. This is really exciting. These tracks are really fresh. So there's almost certainly a leopard within a few hundred meters of us now. Too hard. So hopefully we just found him lunching in the sand. So in the early morning, when there's a lot of dew around back there at the moment, a lot of big cats prefer to walk down non grassy areas so as not to get their feet or face wet. So Dave, I want your eyes to be sharp. Let's check. All right, here we go. We've got his tracks. There are the tracks coming straight down here. So where has he gone? So we're just going to have to get off the vehicle shortly. I just need to double check where this is, where his tracks are going. While we do this, it's going to actually, sorry, take a little bit of concentration and walking in the bush. So while I go see if I can grab this leopard by the tail and pull it out of the bush, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Hopefully, hopefully no grabbing of the tail will occur. Nevertheless, we'll give Brent a chance to track. We're actually going to see if we can help them follow up on this leopard from our northern side. So Brent's approaching, driving up from the south. We are coming down from the north. And we'll see if we can't assist in any way possible, depending, of course, on our signal. And hopefully the leopard decides to wander into a good signal area for us. Either way, let's investigate and see if it's decided to come towards quarantine. So, as we were saying, Nice chilly morning like this morning. Everything is out and about and moving, including the predators that might otherwise be less inclined and feeling a bit lazy. Oh, I know that Brent's been mentioning a little bit about tracking 101 and the, possi the probability that a leopard might decide to avoid the grass since it's a bit cold and damp and a bit miserable for them to walk through. I'm just going to check the edge of quarantine and then head down towards the Juma pan. This morning there were some very sleepy zebra here. Tax, tax. morning, Buffalo, right where I left you. Just while I try and get hold of Taxon. OK, Brent's managing. These two buffaloes definitely spent the night here. They were here 
first thing this morning, looking almost sinister in the half light of the evening. No, boy, it's all right. With their usual consort of ox pickers, already up and about and active and picking off ticks. This gentleman looks as though he's got some kind of skin disease. That's not just mud, whether it's a fungal infection or some kind of mange. Looks almost like mange. You can see parts around his neck and around his forelimbs that are almost raw. Shame, boy. It can't be terribly comfortable. Oh, Oxpicker doing a thorough ear, inf thorough ear inf inspection. <laughs> Less appreciated. Here's a yellow bolt. Oh, no, it's just the way the light was reflecting. Got quite excited there. Look at that. There's the juvenile on the right. And the two adults sitting at the top. Let me grab my binoculars quickly and check something with those birds. That juvenile reaching almost the point of adulthood. Usually the juvenile ox pickers have redder bull, oh, blacker bulls than the adults, but this one has gone yellow. It's interesting. It made me actually check twice just because I thought that we might have a cuckoo, but it's not. It is most definitely an ox, juvenile ox picker. It's just almost reached adulthood. He's not enjoying their attentions at all. Went up to his buddy and told him it was time for him to move. Oh, big stretch. He's out the joints after lying in the chilly cold grass. He's watching in Arizona. You were wondering a bit about the buffalo's fearsome reputation. You were asking if the buffalo is the most likely to be aggressive towards humans. It's an interesting one, Christopher. Yes, male buffalo do have a well-deserved reputation for people on foot. A lot of the time they spend, well, they feel slightly unsettled because they are more vulnerable away from the herd. That plus their aging slightly, these dugger boys, as they are known, makes them extra specially grumpy. And then they tend to lie in pans and in the shade of bushes. And that makes them, or makes it very easy to surprise both yourself and the buffalo if you are not exceptionally careful whilst walking. Would I say they're the most likely to attack us? Oh, somebody's having a good scratch. Mm, yes, probably. They can be fairly aggressive encountered on foot and that's just a fear response more than anything else I, I always hesitate to use the word aggression because i don't think it's an entirely fair word it implies an unnecessary response to something whereas animals when they do respond aggressively to humans it's because they are frightened and they're exhibiting an e a fight response rather than a flight response generally a buffalo is the animal most likely not to turn away from a charge, so it's most likely to carry through with it. So that and the hippo, Christopher, a hippo outside of water, are probably the two most dangerous animals to encounter on foot. A buffalo herd is a completely different animal. A buffalo herd, you can go and sit like Brent did during big cat weeks, sit on a termite mound whilst walking and let them move all around you. And as long as you don't present, present any kind of threatening posture, it will be quite content with your presence. Sometimes a bit curious, I might approach. The only way that a buffalo herd is very dangerous is if there's some kind of stampede situation. So, for example, that morning that we had to rush to get Scott off quarantine whilst he was going for his morning jog, 
because the buffalo were being chased by the Nkuhuma lionesses straight up towards him. The only time a buffalo herd is exceptionally dangerous. And at the moment, with our tracking, I know that for both Brent and myself, we've been playing Dodge the Buffalo. There's lots of them around at the moment, lots of these Duggar boys. And the with the vegetation as thick as it is, we're both walking at half the speed we might usually whilst tracking. They're not an animal to be underestimated. They move far faster than you think is even possible. We've spoken a lot about the relationship between ox pickers and the, the animals that they sit on and the way in which they can be both beneficial in terms of picking off ticks and harmful in the way in which they keep wounds open. Miss Lynn has asked one step further, do ox pickers spread disease between the different animals by moving from animal to animal, or from buffalo to buffalo? Not really that I can think of. It's far more likely to be the ticks that spread the disease or just naturally because buffalo are herd animals, their close physical contact is going to spread whatever problem they happen to have regardless. So no, generally ox pickers not spreading disease. The only thing that they might do is creates the possibility for infection just by keeping wounds open and stopping them from healing. There's one buffalo bull that lives around this area that has a huge hole in his shoulder that I've seen over the last two or so months that just hasn't healed thanks to the ox pecker's constant niggling attention and pecking at that wound. So in that sense, they can be incredibly harmful to the animal. It's an interesting one. It's such an interesting dynamic. I can't really think of much else in nature or that many other examples out here of a relationship that can be as beneficial as the ox pickers can be and at the same time as harmful as the ox pickers can be. It's an interesting dynamic. All right, I'm gonna start heading towards the Juma Pan. I want to see whether or not that leopard's very much on the move. Brent's got tracks of him moving up the Mawati drainage line, so the river system, the largest river system in Juma. It doesn't flow constantly. In fact, it hardly ever flows, but it is a river system nonetheless. I just want to go and investigate and see playing, again, playing Dodge the Buffalo. Now, I've said that they're the most, they're the most likely to exhibit that kind of dangerous behavior to humans on foot. That being said, I have encountered lots of buffalo on foot, and I've, it's been a very, very small percentage that has actually deliberately or come closer or approached me. 99.9% .9 of the time, that animal's trying to move away, I've spotted it before they've seen me and just moved out of its way completely. So it's, you know, the accidents that do happen with buffalo are less common than a car accident from living in the city. It's a very, very different thing. It's just that we've got this intrinsic, not lack of understanding, but we're no longer as connected with the natural world as we used to be. the behind the scenes way that we operate and that is whilst Brent is tracking on foot you want to know if Dave who is on camera with Brent this morning would be able to go with him or if he stays on the vehicle to listen to the, the communications from final control and Keith the answer is most of the time the cameramen stay on the back occasionally I mean, it's, for them it's nice to get off and stretch stretch their legs and sometimes go tracking but for the most part they will stay on the vehicle so that if something happens let's say for example i drive down to the dam now and my signal disappears or i stop and my signal disappears or in fact i breathe funny or look in the wrong direction and my signal disappears in that case 
case, sorry, <laughs> in that case, then yes, it's very important for Dave to be in comms so that he can shout across to Brent and say, he's come back, Jamie's disappeared off the face of the planet kind of deal. So it is important for that. They can also then, Final Control can also feed through updates about what I'm doing so that once Brent gets back to the vehicle, Dave can pass those on to him and we can coordinate our movements from there. Sight. First thing in the, on a chilly morning. Hello, dwarf mongoose. Are you cold? Are you cold? Yes. <laughs> They're currently basking away in the sun, trying to warm themselves. The smallest predator on Juma. I spoke yesterday about impala being on everybody's menu, except perhaps the dwarf mongoose. <laughs> definitely except a dwarf mongoose. You can actually see how cold they are. They're all puffed up and trying to bake themselves warm in the sun. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And quite as many as we have seen or that we saw yesterday at Buffalo's Hook Dam. Also very, very relaxed. <laughs> I was looking to see if there'll be any reaction from them. This looks like it's all adults grouped together, so no juveniles in this particular family at the moment, or they're all underground in that termite mound or in the termite burrow system that they inhabit. Now, that could be that that is an active or part of an active termite mound. Most likely it's not, but there is a possibility that it is, in which case they'll additionally have the warmth coming up from the termite mound itself through the vents. Warm enough now. Off we go. Time to go and find some food. Shame, you can just imagine how drenched they're going to be moving through this dew covered grass at only about two inches in height. Mm, some a bit more reluctant than others. You always get the morning people and the non morning people. Mongoose and meerkat are interesting animals. So for the most part, they are very, very well adapted to preserving as much water as possible. So they're not nearly as water dependent as some of the larger mammals out here. They've got very well developed kidneys. Plus they also get, are very capable of processing the liquid of the prey that they catch. So the various insect species provides them with most of their um, hydrating needs. That being said, they will drink and they will quite happily drink. I read once, or I was told once somewhere that a meerkat, so basically a mongoose that's adapted for the desert, I read once that a, mo that a meerkat will never drink. That is absolutely not true. I have seen mongoose or me and meerkats sprint to water before, being very thirsty. So they do drink. Um, not as regularly as we see the other animals do. And a lot of the time, just bear in mind that when you're that tiny and you don't really want to go risk walking too far away from the safety of your bolt holes, going down to a dam to drink is not ideal. But licking the moisture off even each other, but also off the blades of grass, is also a great way of meeting hydration needs. 
on a dewy morning like this morning, they definitely won't need to go out of their way to find something to drink. Just listening to the harsh cackle of the lilac-breasted rollers calling above my head, right into the sun. I am now almost blinded. All right, little dwarf mongoose. Oh, there we go. Well done, jean -Dre. That's very impressive. I can't even look. Oh, he's, all, he's doing his rolling. That's so cool. That is awesome. Now, oh, that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we have the best cameraman, I think, quite possibly in the world. Because there's that one opportunity for one shot and Jandre got it. Bravo, Jandre. That was very impressive. That is why that lilac-breasted roller is called a lilac-breasted roller. That flying is basically rolling in the sky. And that was displaying to, it was one male displaying to another male. That's what was happening there. How many of you have got to see a lilac-breasted roller or any roller rolling on live? That's very impressive. Last. I'm so impressed. I am so, so impressed. And it was straight into the sun as well. I couldn't see anything. I could not have told you where that lilac-breasted roller was if you paid me. I'm squinting, just lifting my head. OK, last view of our dwarfies. And then I think let's go and see if we can't help or at least put ourselves in a vicinity to help with this leopard tracking. <laughs> was awesome. Now, we had a question a little bit earlier before I got distracted by the dwarf mongoose about whether or not any of the viewers have ever spotted an animal before we have. I can tell you for certain that the camera... Um, Jean-Dre is now telling me he needs to just have a